Hello and welcome to another episode of um, a Sea Drones webinar um, series. And I'm very grateful today to have Surf Life Saving New South Wales on the call with us. Um, we're just going to wait a couple more minutes until um, a couple more people roll on in, probably starting about a minute or so. So just hang tight um, and yeah, look forward to presenting this one with you. It's going to be an exciting one. Cheers. All right, well, without further ado, um, again, welcome and thank you very much to everyone that's joining with us, joining us today. We hope you and your families are safe, well, um, and taking and making the most of um, this time um, during this period. Um, I'd firstly like to thank the team at Surf Life Saving New South Wales for joining us today. Um, you know, they, they it has been one of the most exciting um, drone programs that I for sure have been involved in, in the part, over the past three years. So, um, you know, Surf Life Saving New South Wales has the best part of 129 surf clubs stretching from far north um, to far south in New South Wales. Um, and we're joined today by a member of their drone team and chief remote pilot, um, Paul Hardy. Um, welcome, Paul. Thanks, Rash. Thanks for having me. Uh, um, we're going to kick off the webinar today with a poll, um, as we normally do, but throughout the conversation today, um, we're, we'll be asking a number of polls. So the first poll question today is, do you hold a current RAPL, um, a remote pilot's license? Um, it's just one of our first ones that we'd like to kick off. Um, a friendly reminder to everyone, throughout the webinar today, um, we do encourage questions, um, and I'm sure Paul will be up for asking those questions. Um, and yeah, feel free to submit them on the on the right hand side. Alrighty. Um, so as I said, joined by Paul Hardy, um, Chief Remote Pilot at um, Surf Life Saving, and, and myself, I'm the CEO and Managing Director of um, Sphere Drones. Um, and welcome you all to today's webinar. To further dive deeper into what the agenda looks like, um, so. We're going to learn a little bit more about Paul um, and the history behind Surf Life Savings New South Wales drone program, the progress, the fleet varieties, their objectives, current operations, some key learnings, um, especially around training and um, standard operating procedures, and then some of the emergency assistance work that they've been working on. And you know, the the, the bold question that we're putting out to Paul is, what does the future of the Surf Life Saving New South Wales drone program look like? To talk a little bit more about. Um, us and the team at Sphere Drones. Sphere Drones is a, um, we envisage and our purpose is to be the go-to um, drone provider across a dynamically and, and constantly changing drone environment. Um, we offer a range of capabilities from sales, repairs and maintenance, training, consulting, rentals, on-site flight operations support and a, a range of enterprise agreements. So the ones in particular that we've worked very closely with um, with surf life saving are specifically around the maintenance and the automated enforced maintenance of um, their, their diverse um, drone fleet alongside with an enterprise agreement which engages a number of our um, new products that we have to offer. Um, so it's quite an exciting time. Surf life saving and the, the drone program, obviously it's surf life saving, we're, we're currently talking surf life saving New South Wales today, but us as a business, we're positioned um, all around the country. So we're locating both offices in Sydney and Perth, but we do have satellite and remote offices in other regions. And we do service a range of other surf life saving organisations across the country, um, and we're positioned to do so. 
Um, with our prior, before handing over to Paul, um, what we will do is that we're going to, like I said, run a couple of polls. But um, one that you know quite surprised me is how many flights do you think the Surf Life Saving UAV team have completed this financial year across New South Wales coastline? So I'm just going to launch that poll. Um, I'll be interested to see these results. It's quite an extensive program, that's for sure. I'm sure the, the team at um, Surf Life Saving, for those that are tuning in, might um, have a sneak peek of what's, um, a sneak hint of what's what's going on across their program, but I would like to hear what the rest of the audience thinks about that. Um, and before passing over Paul, again, if there are any questions throughout today's webinar, feel free to um, submit them there on the right-hand side of um, your control panel. Great. So I'm going to pass over to Paul now to talk a little bit more about um, their drone program, the progress and where their drone program's at. Over to you, Paul. Cool. Thanks, Paris. Um, firstly, thank you to everyone for your for your time and attendance today. Um, it's really appreciated and know that everyone's time is valuable, um, particularly yeah, around this time. Um, uh, so yeah, Paris and I are here to answer questions. Um, we've got our, our agenda, but happy to tailor it to whatever everyone's interested in, so so flip those through there. Um, a quick background on me before we get get started on the on the slides and chatting a bit more um, is that I've been involved in the in surf life saving for over uh, for about fourteen months now in in New South Wales and previously in New Zealand, uh, and I've been involved in the in the UAV program specifically in New South Wales and Surf Life Saving New South Wales for eight months, um, before which I couldn't actually fly a drone, um, didn't have any qualifications, but been so lucky to work alongside very knowledgeable people. Um, and I continue to learn from from everyone. So um, it's it's a great space that we're in and I think um, yeah great great industry which is there's lots of opportunity there. Um, <clears throat> So, and also been lucky to be supported by the organisation through that. There's been continued investment and support throughout. Um, so as we can see, some quick stats there on how the pro program has grown over the last three years. Um, so it really kicked off in 2017-18 with the introduction of the DPI uh, program, which is a series of drones collecting uh, drone flights over New South Wales beaches. Uh, and collecting uh, flight flight information, um, and we had Westpac come on board that year as well with um, with mobile units, um, which could be sent to any beach. Um, and that was also the year that that um, well known Lennox Head rescue took place. Um, and it's continued to grow from there. So as you can see, our flight numbers just continue to grow. Uh, this year in particular, we've introduced an internal excluded training program um, with, our, with a, a training uh, partner, Aviassist, and that's allowed obviously cost-effective and tailored training for internal um, for our internal members and attracting other members from outside of the organisation. But we'll, we'll go into that further. Um, so I mentioned Westpac and DPI are our two partners in the in the drone program. So Westpac under the Westpac Rescue Lifesaver Drone Program is focused on enabling surf clubs and surf lifesaving branches to use drones for a number of, of uses, and we only uh, we continue to explore what they what they're able to be used for. Um, they've been used, and we'll we'll have a few examples later on about what they've been used for in terms of um, there's, there's a whole range of things, um, but yeah, generally search and rescue, incident response, and then their mobile units, so based with surf life saving duty officers, they can be called out through the state operations centre and used at, at pretty much any beach up and down the coastline. So uh, as, as Paris said, we're based yeah, from border to border with comprehensive um, coverage throughout. Uh, DPI is a bit more of a um, a bit more of a focused approach on specific beaches, collecting research on sharks and other wildlife in the water and capturing that vision, those numbers um, go through to them 
and uh, work with their fisheries team on the research side of things there. Um, but both, what both have in common is uh, they've all the all the drones are, are tracked um, for regulatory and coaching purposes. Um, there's alerts set up when when certain things happen, uh, and the maintenance of those is all is all tracked. They're all so both programs are treated the same in terms of, in terms of uh, training regulations and the professional approach we take. Um, the, quickly, the objectives of, of the Surf Life Saving New South Wales program is to bring UAVs to surf life saving clubs and branches across the coastline. And we want to uh, build them into the current surf life saving platform and the range of services that we offer uh, as a new, a new tool and, to, and as a way of, uh, yeah, a low cost way of providing that surveillance and uh, and safety across the coastline. We need to be mobile and flexible with that um, and also working alongside regulatory authorities. I'm sure everyone's aware of um, the Civil Aviation Safety Authority or CASA um, and so we work closely with, with them to ensure that the busy environment that we operate on, um, both from a flight safety perspective and a maintenance perspective, is um, yeah, we work yeah really closely with them on that. <clears throat> cool. We've got a quick webinar which should pop up in a couple of seconds. Um, but it's have you seen a surf life saving drone fly to beach near you? So you should be able to select the answer, and we'll see some interesting results there. So with the questions, if anyone's submitting questions. We've got some time at the end, which which uh, we'll address them in. But if they're pertinent to what we're discussing, um, Paris might just throw them across to me. Um, so yeah, flick through anything um, anything you want there. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I actually just share that result with the audience, um, so you can see the result there. So 34% said yes, they've seen a surplus saving drone, and 66% of the audience say they haven't. So um, there you go. Awesome. Awesome. When we come back to do this webinar uh, this time next year, hopefully we've grown that and, and there's more people that have interacted with it. Yeah. Sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So quick overview. So we've we've talked about um, our our coverage along the coastline. Um, with yeah, but it's there's a there's a quick a quick map of of where we're based. Uh, we've got a range of equipment that's used, um, and we're pretty pretty lucky to have it all tracked and, and managed um, and then and maintenance tracked um, by Sphere and get um, automated emails and follow up um, on a daily basis in terms of getting things in for maintenance and the, and the ETA on those. Um, yes, we use the Phantom 4 Pro, Mavic 2 Enterprise Zoom, and we've got a couple of jewels as well, which are the, are the thermal option. Uh, and then we've got a fleet of Mavic Minis, which we use for training. And um, we'll chat through training a bit further. And we've got one Matrice 600, um, which is based at the at the New South Wales um, HQ. Um, there's our, our pilot figures for this year. Um, 80 paid paid operators and pilots, and 370 volunteer volunteer members. Um, just a quick slide, I guess, to highlight the, the variety of the craft that we use and show some images there of them in use. Um, so our two main operational craft being the Phantom 4s uh, and the Mavic 2 Enterprises, which have that speaker attachment, if anyone can see on that, on the middle image um, on the bottom, uh, which is used as standard across all surf life saving operations and has been used in, in real life rescues to warn swimmers of sharks nearby to communicate with people in trouble to ensure whether they were safe or not or um, and and to ask them to uh, so one example was a kite surfer that was in trouble the pilot asked the kite surfer to um, wave his hands if he was in trouble and the kite surfer put his hand on top of his head indicating he was okay um, the pilot 
then checked in about five minutes later um, and the kite surfer hadn't been able to self-rescue. The wind had died down and he waved his hand and the lifeguards were sent out to rescue him. So just an example there. <clears throat> so we've chatted through um, both both programs and what, what the UAVs are used for. Um, and so we've, we've chatted through, yeah, aerial beach surveillance, the regular flights undertaken by clubs on the beaches, um, monitoring marine creatures, checking the conditions before setting up a patrol area, um, and then they're used specifically for rescues and incidents, uh, both at those, at those beaches or possibly unpatrolled locations that we might get called out to. Um, we'll then use them for internal events like um, Surf Life Saving State Champs, um, or IRB events or boat events across the state. Um, and then, yeah, search and rescue ties into that rescue and incident support um, where we can provide a low risk and low cost way of searching previously inaccessible areas like cliff lines or um, rock platforms or that kind of thing that might be too dangerous or, or take a lot of time to, to check. Yeah, so this year we've developed an internal training program for the excluded sub two kilo operations. <clears throat> and we've got a quick question here. Uh, so are you a member of a surf life saving club? If everyone wouldn't mind just uh, quickly selecting that and letting us know, we we'll get some interesting statistics back from that. <clears throat> Oh, we'll wow. come back from well, no, we'll come back to that one. I accidentally opened and closed the uh, poll real quick, but we'll come back to that one at the end. Um, whilst I get that back online, so we'll come All back to that. No worries, everyone, save your answers for that. Um, yeah, so introduction of an internal training program. Um, so, like everything in surf life saving, we um, run training to ensure that it's been doing being done safely and fits into the whole surf life saving framework of, of public safety. Um, so a two day course has been previously contracted out to training providers. Um, and this involves some cost and wasn't quite tailored to what, what we needed. Um, and so we've worked with AV Assist um, who are based in Newcastle in New South Wales, um, but also serviced nationally. Um, to develop an internal course and to train our own internal tra trainers who can go and run this course um, to our members, which means we can run it in a more flexible way. We can run um, a, a week of evening courses followed by half a day of practical flying. Um, we can run the conventional weekend approach. Um, there's, there's sort of no limit to how we can do this now and coupled with an online learning platform which, which this course is on, and some pre-learning content, content which is being developed currently. Um, we are becoming more and more flexible in how we can run this training. And Paul, we might just run that poll again. So are you a member of a surf life-saving um, club? So that poll will just pop up right now. I'll just wait for a few more to come through. Yep. Alrighty, thank you very much. And okay. I think you might want to talk about the pathway through to the training. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Paris. So, one of the things that we're seeing with the UAV program is that it attracts members who previously might not have wanted to get involved with Surf Life Saving. It sort of highlighted that. There are other ways other than uh, being, a, being a swimmer or being in a boat um, to get involved for, for members of the community. So it's actually attracted people to join their local surf clubs and then do the training, um, as well as attracting previous members, of course, who are keen, keen to join. Um, they then uh, complete the, the operator induction program, the course, and then there's further pathways which are available later on as they get involved more and more in the incident support and rescue 
uh, side of things. Uh, so that's a remote pilot license or REPL um, where you can uh, join, join the Surf Life Saving remote operator certificate, uh, report to myself as chief remote pilot and uh, fly in more restricted areas. You actually learn how to fly larger craft as well. Um, so there's that as an opportunity and then and then there's also uh, branch UAV coordinators and the branch UAV instructors based within each surf life saving um, branch of which there are 11 uh, broken up up and down the coastline so there, there's a range of opportunities and a growth pathway there to keep members interested and fulfilled throughout. I've just got a few examples now of how we've supported other emergency services. So this one up at uh, Port Macquarie off Sea Acres National Park. Uh, so this drone was being flown at Flynn's Beach. Uh, there was a fire reported nearby at the National Park um, and it was tasked quickly within minutes. It was there and airborne. Uh, and if we go to the next slide, we've got some text. Um, where um, the, the pilot was able to check the location, check that it wasn't affecting any residential addresses or, or other property, uh, and check that there were all the trail paths within the uh, National Park were safe and clear, uh, and then the fire was dealt with by fire and rescue. So just, just one quick example there. Um, We've got another example of of use of a drone down at Tarthra Beach. So one of our most most southern clubs in New South Wales, uh, New South Wales. Um, this drone was tasked to provide support. Uh, there were a fair few marine creatures around uh, while this whale was being recovered off the rocks, uh, and so they had the the UAV in the air. Um, observing the scene and where it was, it was recovered off the rocks, towed to the nearest beach, and uh, and then taken away by a digger. Cool. Another uh, quick example where we supported marine rescue, uh, also on the far south coast where. Uh, a number of mobile units are uh, deployed was um, where a random random check by a duty officer as he was driving along the coastline saw a vessel displaying their v-sheet um, which is requesting assistance uh, he launched the drone double checked that um, that what had happened and, and saw specifically that v-sheet displayed um, he then contacted surfcom um, and the state of operations centre, who um, then followed followed the call flow and and called marine rescue um, and the local surf life saving club call out team, uh, and then who were able to um, ascertain that the IRB uh, that the boat was fine, um, and uh, and while it was towed back by a member of public. Um, looking looking forward in surf life saving, and uh, we've we've got some quick dot points here on on what we're developing and what we're focusing on. Um, so we we continue to work on interagency synergy, um, like the examples I've given given before, and um, there's there's other examples. Um, like long-term search and rescue where we've been tasked over multiple days to check uh, kilometres worth of, of cliff line um, where uh, other agencies like SES would have, would have spent much longer and at much higher risk. Um, we were able to check it fairly quickly and, and safely um, and, uh, and prov provide reports back to other agencies. Um, so yeah, we continue to work on on those relationships. Uh, we're developing more specific search and rescue training in terms of uh, what does someone uh, who's drowning look like from a drone. Um, what, how do we, 
how do we identify features on a beach that from from an aerial view which is a view that we haven't had before so it's it's all an um previously unknown path and we're we're finding out more and more ways how we can use drones to identify yeah how we can keep the public more safe um some uh some other technical sort of advances that we're looking at are extended and beyond visual line of sight so if anyone had the chance to join sphere and av assist webinar a couple of weeks ago on on those points uh, they'll know what we're talking about there um, we're looking at automation and um, and a bit yeah a bit more automation to to allow us to do the job safer and more um, more accurately as you saw where we fly seven days a week uh, we're currently flying um, at 13 locations on a on a daily basis from uh, 8 30 a.m to 4 p.m in the afternoon um, trying to do three flights an hour weather permitting um, so the more automation we can bring in there the more comprehensive our searches will be uh, and and yeah, lower the risk of error um, we're looking at coastal mapping um, and and people counting of of beaches um, in order to do risk assessments and provide information back to local land managers on that um, and live streaming which is a situ situational awareness piece where the where surfcom would be able to see what we're doing um, or what the drone can see um, and that could be shared with other agencies as well um, to allow like a real-time snapshot of what's happening um, on scene Yeah, how are those questions? Yeah, all right. Yeah. yeah. So thank you very much, Paul, for um, I guess presenting that that slide deck together. And um, we do have a number of questions that have come through over the um over the course of um the webinar itself. Um, there was a question that came through earlier on in the piece around um the use cases of ex of an example being the the Mavic Enterprise the the dual the one with the thermal current well, did you yep. have a, a use case as an example that you had there yeah we haven't done too much research yet on the dual specifically uh, what what we'd like to do is get someone out in the water um, see what they look like using a thermal camera um, do do some of that more work I guess would be a particular use case there uh but that is currently fairly unexplored part yeah sure yep. fantastic there's another question around um the environment of an op of operation so how do you um endure and how do you deal with i guess the wind and salt spray and effects on the rpa so i guess probably split that up into two parts um firstly i guess judgment on wind conditions and then probably the second part is i guess the maintenance program yeah yeah, hundred um, percent. I'll I'll chat to the judgment of conditions and and that kind of thing, and then let you chat to the maintenance program. Yeah, um, fantastic. But uh, what we generally look for is not over 30, 30 knots of wind, um, and by that time there's chop on the surface surface of the ocean. Um, you'll be able to tell um, as you as you're taking off. Sand will be flying. Um, the the drone will be getting yeah sand sand through it um, you'll be able to tell by that point um, and the Mavics in particular we found more stable than the Phantoms but um, both are pretty advanced when it comes to warning you of, of, of high wind and that kind of thing so that's what we yeah. do on the beach and then yeah if you wanted to chat Paris on yeah sure so in terms of um, the sort of fly saving New South Wales drone program and the way we run and manage the maintenance is Every aircraft comes in at a um, hourly interval, um, which is established off a automated maintenance notification through a, a data a set of flight data coming through into our system. So at that interval maintenance period, we do a deep clean of the aircraft. Um, you know, get the best part of the isopropyl through the aircraft, um, the compressor. Um, we do an aircraft firmware update. We update um, the aircraft the modes, the batteries. Um, and on top of that, if there are any wearable parts, there are wearable part um, changeovers on that kind of thing. So hopefully that answers um, that question. There's a there's another question here. Have you had any engagement from a night flight perspective at this point in time? 
Yes, to fly at night, that would need to be done. Um, we've, we've talked quickly about the remote pilot license or REPL and the, and the company having a remote operator certificate. So to look at doing night flying, that would need to be done by licensed pilots um, and is definitely a, a possibility. Um, given that we can't currently operate uh, IOBs over the water, um, what we're currently looking for is at, at the moment is that any night urgent night searches will probably be done by the helicopter um, given we've got pretty good coverage along the New South Wales coastline and we can't fly a drone and a helicopter in unison so we'd leave it to them and then if they're yeah we we'd, we'd sort of stick to the daytime operations currently but good question and taken on note Fantastic. Um, there's yep. another question here, and there's been a couple of these throughout um, the webinar around. There's a couple of people online today with um, their REPL. Um, they mm -hmm. live near beaches or um, they're interested in volunteering for um, with surf life saving. So what's what's the process and, and how did you want to, uh, and what are the opportunities there? Are you guys looking for more um, volunteers at this point in time? Yeah, definitely. It's obviously a strange time at the moment, but with the development of, of the online learning content, uh, there's more and more opportunities. Um, for previously licensed pilots with the REPL, uh, we slim down the course, so there's uh, a small practical flight component and then um, and, and not as much theory or no theory on the, on the aircraft itself in terms of componentry. All we run through is the surf life saving UAV standard operating procedures specifically and how UAVs fit into the rest of the operation, use of a surf life saving radio, um, and then working alongside your local surf life saving club. So you set up as part of them, you um, would report through to the patrol captain on the day and, and like another asset. Um, so it's just about bringing, bringing you on board, but that, that can be, that's done in a day. So would, yeah, definitely like to, like to be in touch with anyone who has tuned in and is keen to help out. So yeah, my contact info is there. Um, best to yeah. flip me an email um, and I'll definitely be in touch. Yeah, fantastic. And um, yeah, I'll also, um, if anyone does reach through our channel, happy to share um, Paul's details over too. Um, yeah. Now, uh, another question here, in terms of um, like your standard operating procedures, how do you integrate the drone into your day-to-day -day beach? Obviously, it's a popular area and it's a, it's quite interesting topic. But there's there's clearly standard operating procedures as to what your team um, establish and use. But maybe you could probably talk a little bit more to um, in terms of how you actually integrate the drone into your day-to-day -day operation on a beach. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. The the standard operating procedures probably deserved a few slides by themselves but um they so we we look to incorporate drones yeah as, as another tool um the space is one of the big things that we found on particularly smaller beaches so we look to combine the so we need a 30 meter exclusion zone for those not aware um and it goes for all all drone operations 30 meters from anyone so we have cones and signage which we set out on beaches and we try and minimize the amount of space that we take up on a beach um, by combining that with our IOB or jet ski launching area uh, we've each operation has a tent and so they use that as part of the, of the barrier um, on, on one side so we can still interact with the public um, and so that's that's how we look to do that um, and then the drone pilot will have a radio, and he will be a he or she, sorry, should uh, will be able to contact the patrol captain immediately if they spot something dangerous in the water or someone in trouble, or would like to inform them of changing conditions. Um, and so that's that's how they be in touch there, because um, they might be quite removed from the, where the normal patrol is, if that makes sense. Yeah, cool. And and there's another question here, like the the main difference between fixed and mobile locations. Um, the mm. mobile units. So mobile units, I'm guessing, are the. You probably want to talk more to that. Yeah, mobile units. Um, we we talk about um, being based out of the duty officer vehicles. So uh, imagine you've got. It's the analogy that people use is um, you've got your your sort of standard police stations or or police officers as the 
as the Surf Life Saving Clubs. And then to fill in all the gaps around, you've got detectives or people who will show up in an incident. Um, they're, they're alerted to that by SURFCOM, the State Operations Centre, and they've got um, more qualifications um, in terms of dealing with other emergency services um, and, and ensuring that everyone works together for the best outcome. Um, they're not there to tell the, the average club member how to do their job. They're just to, there to let other emergency services know um, what's happening and how surf life saving can help. And so as part of that, uh, most will carry around a, a drone with them uh, for yeah, quick quick incident response, if that makes sense. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. And um, yeah. To, to confirm, um, surf life saving has a um, REOC um, just a, as a confirmation point there. Yeah, yeah, correct. correct. Yeah. Um, there's a couple more questions here. So um, what, what's the percentage of your flight operations from excluded versus included um, category? Yeah, uh, good, good question. It is um, currently, um, a major percentage of flights are being undertaken in the in the excluded category. Due to those, if you put it as a percentage of, of flights, it would be above 95% due to the the contracted seven days a week DPI operations, as well as the rest, Westpac Rescue Lifesaver drone operation, drone program operations, which are um, which are during, yeah, which are done by the duty officers for a start and then the surf life saving clubs. Um, and the, the bulk of their operations are sub two kilo. The REOC operations are currently used for um, more um, research and testing for the, the state UAV team uh, at our HQ and then at specialized locations along the coastline, so a smaller percentage. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and probably take the the last question um, on board, and, and probably talking a little bit more around the management systems and how your pilots interact with um, your program on a day to day. So maybe you mm. want to talk a little bit more around um, yeah the platforms that you work with on a day to day. Yeah, great great question there. Um, so currently we're using a few a few technological solutions. Um, which has been nice working from home to be able to log in and, and monitor those. So we've got a rostering solution which we use um, and then we've got AVCRM as a tool which allows pilots each day to go through and do their uh, job planning and risk assessment of their local area um, and that will show them, it draws in a whole lot of data from uh, weather, NOTAMs, um, uh, yeah, no terms about other aircraft in the area, using the area, um, bushfires, um, that was pretty pertinent a couple of months ago. Um, uh, yeah, the whole process allows them to draw a map for where they're operating on the beach. That's immediately emailed through to me and, um, and double checked and um, pretty important from a, a safety and compliance point of view, particularly when the MOS comes out in terms of uh, maintaining records and that kind of thing. Uh, and then we use on the back end uh, air data as a tool that uh, collects all the all the flight information from each flight and that's um, that syncs up and is used on the back end for maintenance hours and that kind of thing. Uh, and that is yeah, that's our, our setup pretty much from a drone perspective. Yeah, fantastic. And I think what we'll do there is um, probably just pull up some there, Paul. And um, firstly, thank you very much for joining us today. And, you know, thank you for sharing what the Surf Life Saving Drone Program looks like. And as I said earlier on in our presentation, if there's anyone that does have any questions or even if there's a if there's someone out there with an REPL or interest in getting involved in the Surf Life Saving Drone Program, um, feel free to reach out to the three drones and we'll pass that through to Paul or feel free to reach out to Paul directly. Um, I hope you all um, very much enjoyed and thank you very much, Paul, for today. An absolute pleasure. Thanks, Paris, for having uh, yeah, having me.
No problems. And just before we get going, um, we've got a couple of upcoming webinars um, in the pipeline. So next Thursday, we've got one on drone solutions supporting the management of COVID-19 with DJI. Um, it's quite exciting to have them on board for the call. Um, and then the following Friday, um, we've got one on how to make your minimum operating standards work for you. So quite an interesting topic moving forward into the coming week. So um, again, thank you very much for joining us on today's webinar and another um, episode. Thank you to Paul and the team at Surf Life Saving for working with us. And, um, you know, it's been fantastic to be able to support an organisation like yours. Um, again, Stay safe, stay healthy, and um, if you have any questions, feel free to shoot them through. Cheers. Thanks, Paul. Cool. Cheers, everyone.